Here we all are. I am so happy to see you tonight. My name is Jan Powers, and I want to welcome you all to our first meeting of North 40 Storytelling Guild, Dallas area. We actually meet in Plano, we're the North 40. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all tonight. We have a real treat. It has been our tradition for years and years, it seems now, to have a workshop for our very first meeting in January. Everyone shows up to pay their dues and bring guests and attend the workshop. So we've had wonderful tellers, Elizabeth Ellis, Tony Simmons, uh, Fran Stahl from Oklahoma, many, many, many tellers. And then with COVID coming, we've had the opportunity to have people not only out of town, but far out of town. So tonight you all are in for a treat. Let me say that we <laughs> are being supported and sponsored with TSA, Tejas Storytelling Association. They've begun a virtual series featuring all our affiliated, excuse me, affiliated guilds around the area. So that's what tonight is. The North 40 is being highlighted. And here we are, we get to share our workshop with all of you good people. So let me see if I check, check the boxes here. Tejas, support. So keep your eye out. There'll be more information coming to you about other virtual events that we as Tejas members get to participate in. So that's grand. Now, I want to tell you about Reggie Carpenter. I'm only going to tell you about my experience with Reggie because I know some of you have been paying attention to the poster and that you <laughs> have clicked on her website because I've had people replying in our emails to our guild going, wow, she's wonderful. And I've been listening to some of her videos. And so, yes, yes. And if you'd like to hear more, and I think you will after we're done with our workshop tonight, then you can go back to that poster and you can click and go to Reggie's website and find her and listen some more. Last September, I traveled with Tony Simmons to the Tempanogas Storytelling Festival. And the very first evening there, as I was walking across the field to this beautiful, beautiful amphitheater there under the broad blue sky, Reggie was coming up the hill and she just stopped right in front of me and put her hand out and we chatted for a moment. And then as the hours and the days went on, I loved listening to Reggie's songs and her stories. And I thought, ooh, I think we ought to have her come to Texas right here to begin the year. And hopefully she'll get to come to Texas yeah. in the real live person. So yes. yes, that would be wonderful. So I think Reggie, that I would like to turn all of this right over to you right now. I wanna say welcome to you from all of us. And we're so happy to have you here tonight. Reggie Thank Carpenter. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, yay. Well, look at all of you beautiful people. Uh, Janine, I've never seen you with your hair down. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, why don't you go ahead and put in the chat what's brought you here tonight? What is something you are, you're hoping for tonight? And Ellen, what a treat to see you again. Good to see you. What is it that you're hoping for? What did you want to learn or practice? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Oh, thank you, David. It's also nice to meet you. Do you have any? Oh, good. I'm glad my workshop time. Yeah, I thought that was pretty clever. Wordsworth. <laughs> <laughs> oh nice yeah me too personal stories are a challenge they're hard oh great mm -hmm. yeah 
higher level than conversation. Thank you. Great. Well, I have a rather deceptively simple question to ask you. And that is, what is a story? What is a story? Go ahead and write it or unmute yourself and tell me, what is a story? What do you think it is? You can put it in the chat or you can just unmute and tell me what you think. It's a deceptively simple question. Anybody got an idea? I'm thinking a sharing of what's happened, um, something personal, adventures, quiet happenings, what you're thinking about, what you're involved with, mm -hmm. a telling of that, a sharing mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say share, too. Something you want to share. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I think it's everybody's uh, desire to share their lives and their personal experiences. Um, as simple as that. Yeah. 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 And co-creating co co-creating a new experience from someone's personal experience yeah i agree are people nodding their heads as you hear these what you think yeah me too the heart's truth oh that's beautiful ellen thank you well i think you know when we talk about story we can always identify the pieces of a story, right? The parts of a story. And our teachers ever since third grade have been trying to get us to do that. You know, a story has characters and a setting. It happens over time. It has a, a problem and a resolution. These are all things that a story has. But a story, that's kind of like saying that a human being is a head, a torso, two arms, and two legs. Because a human being, of course, is so much more than that. And so is a story. Those items are the thing a story has. But a story for tonight is going to be a personal story, and really any story, is going to be an oral narrative that shares something about the human experience. It shares something about the human experience. And a, a good story versus a conversation or retelling of some series of events always carries with it an eternal truth. And Again, that sounds sort of deceptively simple, but it always boils down to love, betrayal, you know, faithfulness, honesty, all the, the core values that everyone around the world experiences. So rather than just having a story that's about my dog Scruffy, I'm going to tell you a story about my dog, Scruffy, who is also my animal companion, right? So it gets elevated. Things get elevated and distilled. And that's the job of the storyteller. The tricky part is that you have no idea where you're headed when you start. So tonight, I'm going to take you off the hook. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to know what you're doing. You, you don't have to be polished. You don't have to entertain us or me or anybody else. All you're really doing is going fishing. We're not going to unlock the mysteries of the universe by 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock your time. But we can get a little closer. Okay? 
Okay, so we're going to be patient and open with ourselves because creativity is like a flower and it, it doesn't respond to too much heat and too much stress. It goes, oh, I think I'll bloom because it's so nice out here. So we're going to be just very gentle with ourselves and uh, be curious. And that's the, we're going to ask the magic question of at the heart of all creativity which is, what would happen if? That's all, what would happen if? Okay. I also wanna tell you that the way that I'm going to lead you tonight in, in this workshop is just one way. I, I um, you know, I've learned from every single storyteller that I've ever listened to how to, have, how to tell a story. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to learn from one another. Okay, enough of this blurt and blabbing. Let's hear a story. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story tonight that is um, the form of a string of pearls. And I've done that because I've, I've chosen that specifically because I want to show you a narrative form that is really episodic, but is tied together by a theme at the beginning and the end. So it has a circular, a circular structure. And after we're done, all I'm going to ask you to do is to share some of the imagery that is staying in your mind and your heart afterwards. And you can write that on write that on a piece of paper and then share it in the chart. That's what I would recommend that you do because you may have more than one image that's sticking sticking with you. Okay. I grew up in Northern New York, Northern New York, not upstate New York, not New York City, Northern New York. And um, Northern New York is, is on the St. Lawrence River and it's, uh, it's um, you know, just it's two miles from Canada. And I'm only telling you that just so you know a little bit about um, where I'm from. But this story has a universal uh, setting. Well, summer was winding down like an old tired top. The waves in the St. Lawrence River looked like roosting chickens at sunset, and the hopscotch board and marble circle drawn in blue chalk had long been swept away from my front sidewalk. The streets that were usually filled with boats and tourists all summer long were nearly empty now, and just the citizens of my hometown, Clayton, were running the stop signs. It's September 3rd, and tomorrow is the first day of school. Now, I'm going to have to take a bath and wash my hair that night. My mother is going to ruin my hair by combing it. She <clears throat> has made me a brand new dress and bought me some special squeaky shoes. She's gotten me number two pencils and a composition book and bought me a box of 24 Crayola crayons. Tomorrow, I'm going to go to third grade. I'm eight years old. The next morning, I jump up out of my bed. I run down the beige vinyl carpet runner into the kitchen. I sit down. I have a big bowl of tricks with my usual 18 tablespoons of sugar on top. And then I run out the front door. I'm running down James Street. I'm headed to Clayton Central School. Now, Clayton Central School is built about a mile outside of town on this rolling, grassy plot of land. It doesn't take me long to meet up with some of my friends friends and then we're a gang and pretty soon we're like a school of fish swimming towards the shores of higher learning. We get to Clayton Central School and walk up these steep stone steps and enter that deep dark corridor that smells like freshly polished wax. 
I step away from my friends and march down the hallway. I go past Mrs. Meeks, our nurse. I go past the janitor's closet. I go past the ladies in the office. And then I get to my third grade classroom. Now standing in the doorway of my third grade classroom is my teacher, Mrs. Carter. Mrs. Carter looks down at me and says very cheerfully, good morning, Reggie. And as soon as she says that, it is. Mrs. Carter is very tall and she has black hair that I figured she washed the night before and put up in pink curlers. Well, how do I know? She's still got one of those pink curlers in her hair. She's wearing a, a shirt dress with a belt cinched so tight it makes her belly pooch out underneath. She has black flat shoes and cat glasses. She walks me to my desk. It's the last one in the first row. As we're walking down the aisle, I casually mention to her that she has a very large hole in her stocking. She stops and says, oh, one. Wonderful. Now my fat has somewhere to go on vacation. I am in love. <laughs> well, it doesn't take long for all of my other classmates to show up. And after the lunch ticket and the unintelligible announcements over the loudspeaker and the attendance is taken, Debbie McGrath waves her hand and says, Mrs. Carter, my grandma has a big poochy belly like you do. And Mrs. Carter cups her belly like an egg and says, children, this is not a poochy belly. This is a pouch. Now, which one of you can tell me the name of the marsupial that also has a pouch? And which one of you can tell me the name of the country, which is also a continent, the marsupial lives on? Whichever one of you can tell me the correct answer, that child will receive a kiss. I wave my hand like a puppy dog's tail. And when I answer correctly, Mrs. Carter blows me a kiss. I catch it and put it in my pocket for later. It doesn't take me long to figure out that Mrs. Carter is unlike any teacher I have ever had. She actually likes children. Instead of scowling and yelling at us, she sings and we play games all, all day long. Now, in October of that year, she's teaching us the mathematical concept of more than and less than. She takes a piece of white chalk and writes the more than symbol on the board. Then she takes a piece of colored chalk and draws an eye and a mouth so it looks like a fish's head. Then she draws a hook and she catches the more than symbol in the hook. She then says to us, now children, this is a very simple mathematical concept. This is the symbol for more than. Now, you know that when you go down to the St. Lawrence River and you catch five bullhead, but your friend only catches three bullhead, you've caught more bullhead than your friend, haven't you? And we all go, yeah. And then she says, so this is the concept, more than three. Five is more than three. That's very simple. And we're all like, oh, yeah, that's baby stuff. We learned that in kindergarten. And then she draws the symbol for less than. And once again, the eye and the mouth. But this time, the hook doesn't catch the fish head. Now, this is the symbol for less than. You know that when you go down to the river and you catch eight perch, but your friend catches 10 perch, you have less fish than your friend, don't you? And we're all like, why is she bothering with us? I mean, this is so simple. This is so baby. And then she says, do you all understand? And we're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, good. 
let's practice. And she writes the numbers one and two on the board. Now, children, is the number two more or less than the number one? And we all raise our hands. She says, no, no, no. I don't want you to answer that way. I want you to pretend you are fish. Now, suck your cheeks in. And if two is more than one, I want you to lean to the right. But if it's less than one, I want you to lean to the left. And so we all, we lean to the right. And then she writes the numbers 12 and 13 on the board. Now, is the number 13 more or less than the number 12? So we all, lean one way and we keep leaning back and forth and back and forth and we're laughing so hard we're ticking and talking like metronome and then all of a sudden jack maloney who's the dentist kid is laughing so hard he falls off of his chair and breaks his two front teeth and when he leaves mrs carter to go to the nurse mrs carter winks and says now children does Jack have more or less teeth now than he had this morning? And we all need to do that. When it's time for us to learn our multiplication tables, she puts on the record of the bunny hop. One times one is a one hop hop. Two times two is a two hop hop hop. And that bunny hops so much that it finally figures out that any number times one is that number itself. Well, Mrs. Carter has a very, very strict routine. We start school exactly at nine o'clock and we study something. Then we get to have a snack, my favorite part of the day. Then we have to study something else. Then my second favorite part of the day, lunch followed by recess. Then we have to come back in and we study something else. And then the bell rings at 3.15 and we go home. Now, this routine is only interrupted on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday mornings by our specials. We go to music, art, music, and gym. So on Tuesday mornings, Professor DiStefano rolls his cart into our classroom, and then he hands out online pieces of paper and big thick pencils, and he tells us to draw whatever we want. So like I draw a cow, a duck, a dog, a tree, a cat, pigs, and he goes around and he picks up kids' papers and he looks at them and he usually makes a comment like a compliment and he puts it down. But when he gets to my paper, he picks it up and he goes. And he puts it down and he doesn't pay me a compliment. So the next time he comes in, I label what I have drawn tree, pig, dog, cat, because he obviously cannot tell the difference between a perfectly drawn cat and a perfectly drawn cow. After he leaves one day, Mrs. Carter says, now children, always color outside the lines. It's much more interesting that way. And she takes out her red lipstick and she just put it around her mouth. It always looks like she's just eaten a piece of fresh cherry pie. On Wednesday, we go to music with Mr. Connor. Oh, Mr. Connor is a short, round man who stamps his foot and pounds the piano passionately as we warm up to the Hall of Montezuma and 15 miles on the Erie Canal. Oh, Mr. Connor. His eyes close and he gets lost between the notes when he plays us the record of the Mississippi Delta blues singers. Uh, he loves to play us the Mississippi Delta blues players. And one time he puts on a record for the flight of the bumblebee and he tells us to lift our hands and then he takes out a long yardstick. He's taped a big plastic bumblebee to the end and he goes around and collects our nectar. 
<laughs> on Christmas, he gives me a solo in the Christmas concert. And my mother makes me a brand new dress. She sews sequins of moons and stars and angels all along the hem. And as I'm singing, I feel like I'm standing on a cloud. Mrs. Carter tells me I sing like a bird. And on Thursdays, we go to gym class. Mrs. Carter tells us how lucky we are because we are going to be studying and practicing gymnastics, which she excelled at as a child. Well, when we get into the gym, Mrs. Braba, our gym teacher, has set up the trampoline. The first thing she teaches us about is how to spot somebody on the trampoline. Spotting is when somebody starts to get crazy on the trampoline and you put your arms up and that signals to them that they can fall on you and save themselves. So <clears throat> it turns out finally that it's my turn and I start to jump up and down on the trampoline. Boing, boing, boing. Boeing. Oh my gosh, this is so much fun. Boing, boing. Oh, my teeth kind of hurt when I land. Boing, boing. Oh, I think I just peeped myself. Boing, 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 boing. I'm going higher and higher. And finally, Mrs. Bravo says, Reggie, what time is it? Boing, boing. The clock is way at the top of the other wall. Boing, boing, boing. I say, Mrs. Bravo. It's 1030 and my turn is over. Oh, Mrs. Carter, Mrs. Carter, did you know that she was a firefighter? That's true. I learned this during spelling one day. On Monday morning, we get a list of 10 spelling words. And then on Friday, we have a spelling test. I love spelling because I'm really good at it and I almost always get 100. That week, we are practicing the rule I before E except after C, and mostly you just have to remember it rule. Now, on the test, Mrs. Carter always will say the word, put the word in a sentence, and then say the word again. So something like um, lie. I can't believe you told a lie. Lie. Well, after the test, Mrs. Carter instructs all of us to pass our papers forward and she will collect them from the first person at each, at the beginning of each row. Well, the girl who's at the front of my row is the most popular girl in our class. So we all hand our papers up and she hands them to Mrs. Carter. And Mrs. Carter rifles through them and she says, um, I'm sorry, dear, um, but uh, I don't see your paper here. Hmm, says the girl, I handed it in. Well, dear, I, I'm sorry, but your paper is not here. Well, Mrs. Carter, she says, you must have lost it. Well, that little lie that that girl told was like a spark of fire that <laughs> flitted across the room and landed in the mouth of the boy next to her. And he said, yeah, Mrs. Carter, I saw her hand it in. And then <laughs> that flitted to another place and sparked. And the boy said, yeah, Mrs. Carter, she definitely handed it in. Yeah, Mrs. Carter, she handed it in. I saw her hand it in. And all of a sudden, that flame, the room was just crackling with our deceit. Even I said I saw her hand it in. And you know what? I couldn't have possibly seen her do it. I sat way in the back. Mrs. Carter had a very stricken look upon her face as she released us all to go to lunch and recess. And when we came back, Mrs. Carter was standing there with a crumpled piece of paper in her hand. She was standing behind her desk. Now, this was something she rarely did. We sat down and we crossed our ankles and folded our hands 
like we always did, waiting for Mrs. Carter to begin reading to us. But Mrs. Carter did not pick up a book. She waited for us all to be quiet. And then she said, I found this crumpled up test paper in her desk. So those of you who said you saw her hand it in were very sadly mistaken. You all get an F. And then she looked at each one of us in turn. And we understood the lesson she was teaching us had absolutely nothing to do with spelling. Mrs. Carter read us the most incredible books in third grade. She read us uh, The Velveteen Rabbit, which I loved because I had a stuffed elephant that I really thought was real. And she read us The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Oh, I love that book. My brothers, Dave and Tim, used to lock me in the closet, and I thought it would be so great if I could get out and they couldn't figure out how I'd done it. She, she also read us Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You'll Go. Oh, well, that was exciting because the only places that I ever went and anybody in my entire town ever went was confession. And that was boring. And then she read us my absolute favorite book, Charlotte's Web. Well, when we got to page 86 and Charlotte was at the fair and she was too weak to raise one of her eight slender arms to wave goodbye to Wilbur. I started to cry. Big wet tears started falling down my cheek and splashed on my desk. And I dropped my head into my arms. I started thinking about my grandma Carpenter who had died in a fire before I ever got to meet her. I thought about my cat who caught a cold last year and asked to be let out, but never asked to be let back in. I thought about my neighbor. My mother packed up milk and bread from our grocery store and put it in a bag and told me to go and keep her company while she fed her cats. I thought about my father who is almost always in the hospital now. And sometimes I couldn't remember what he looked like. And I thought about old Yeller. And as she was reading, she walked down my aisle. And when the chapter was over, she rubbed my back and whispered in my ear, I know, dear. I know. I got sick in third grade. I came down with a very, very high fever. And I was so sick I couldn't walk up the stairs to my bedroom. And so my mother just had me lay on the couch and she washed me down with witch hazel in between customers in our family grocery store. My family buzzed around me. And then one day I heard my mother speaking to Mrs. Carter on the phone. And she said, I just don't know when she's going to be coming back, June. A few days after that, my mother came in and put me in a fresh nightie and pulled my hair back into a, a ponytail. And she said, I was going to have a guest. And at four o'clock that afternoon, Mrs. Carter came to visit me and she had a, a thick stack of paper she had have everybody in my class write me a get well letter and they drew me pictures and they didn't even have to label what they were I knew what the pictures were just from the picture and she sat down and she read me every single one of those get well letters and a couple of days after that I started to feel better and I went back to school Well, the year rolled on like a freighter towards the sea. I got glasses. I got chubby. My grades went up because I could finally see the board. 
but my spirits went down because the other kids made fun of me. Mrs. Carter, she let me practice my multiplication tables in the back of the room by jumping rope. She told me I looked absolutely beautiful the day that I came to school wearing at least 12 different mismatched shades of red. She said that naturally curly hair was a blessing and not a curse. And aren't those just the cutest glasses? And doesn't she wish she had a pair? She told me that I was going to learn to read if I just stuck with it. She told me things were going to get better. And it took a while, but eventually they did. Mrs. Carter taught me so much more than math and social studies and spelling and penmanship. Well, it was June 24th and the last bell of the year rang at 315. And all my classmates jumped up and ran out of the class, but I lingered behind. I slowly walked up to Mrs. Carter, who was sitting behind her desk. There were so many things I wanted to say to her and so many questions I wanted to ask her. Like, Mrs. Carter, do you wear your glasses to bed? I don't. Mrs. Carter, do you really think that naturally curly hair is a blessing and not a curse? Because my mother calls it a rat's nest. Mrs. Carter, what are you going to read this summer? I'm going to read everything. Do you like to sing, Mrs. Carter? I do. Mrs. Carter, why do mothers cry so much? And Mrs. Carter, have you ever noticed that when you buy a cupcake from the store, that frosting looks like a man's toupee? But I didn't say any of those things to Mrs. Carter. I just stared at her. And she smiled at me. Her smile was like a sunbeam. And finally she said, I know, dear. I know. And I skipped out of third grade, past the janitor's closet, and Mrs. Meeks, my nurse, and the women in the office. I skipped down James Street until I got to 422 James Street, my family grocery store. My sister Mary was waiting for me. She handed me a piece of blue chalk. I drew the hopscotch board and she the marble circle. And we would play those two games all summer long until it was time to go to fourth grade. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. So go ahead and, and write now in the chat any of the images, all of the images that are coming, brewing up to the top of your mind. And if you want to write them down in a notebook, you can do that too, of course. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, the puppy dog's winning. <laughs> mm, it's wonderful. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to read what everybody else is writing, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was a real snot, that girl. <laughs> she really was. She was awful. And I wanted to be just like her, you know, because she had so many friends and I didn't have any. Mm, I'm so glad. Reminding you of your favorite teachers, Miss Fields. And we share a name, Regina. Yeah. Yeah, remember? He always used to put the, the desks in rows, right? None of this organic circle stuff. No, there aren't many of us, Regina. It's an unusual name. Do you have anything else? Okay. This is the part. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Being caught lying. Yeah. I love when she puts uh, I love when she put the lipstick around her mouth. <laughs> she was really great. So I'm hoping by using the string of pearls structure that you can see that you don't always have to have a story that's focused on just that that that's held together by an event right there's no event in this story there's lots of little moments but there's no there's no real problem is there that's the classic story structure is there's got to be a problem and there's got to be you know a a, a resolution there that story structure is the classic story structure. But to me, stories aren't always about problems. They're about life, which has problems, but isn't always a problem. 
So before I send you into your breakout rooms to, to try to flesh out a story, I want to just bring up this idea that there is always, and I think Elizabeth Ellis said this so nice, so nicely in her book, From Plot to Narrative, there's a difference between what happens in the story and what the story is about. What happens in the story is the plot. What the story is about is the meaning. And that's why I start with that question, what is a story? And oral, for us, a story is an oral narrative that expresses something about the human experience, whether there are humans or not in the story. So I want you to now to take a stab and share in the chat what you think Mrs. Carter is about. What do you think that story is about? Do you all know how to read the chat? You know, okay, okay. So here's the good news. Everybody's right. <laughs> and she did, or she acknowledged that I thought outside the box, right? Because I already read, was a weird kid and kind of stayed that way. <laughs> As you might be able to tell. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the way that you hear and accept a story tells you about you. It's not about me. Because what I feel this story is about is kind of different than what it's, it's the same. It has pieces of it, but it's kind of different. So that every story, every personal story that you hear is telling you who you are, what you come away with it, from it, feeling and experiencing the memories that come up for you. There, the personal story, a well-told personal story is going to help you access the images and the feelings from your life, a really well-told personal story unlocks your story. So it's like a magic trick. It's like a magician is saying, look here at my story when poof, it's your story that you're gonna end up looking at. It's, it's total magic. The storyteller disappears behind the story so that you, the listener, appear to yourself. 
that's when the that's when the art form is working at a really high level so i'm not telling you a story about just a story about my third grade year i'm telling you a story about unconditional love right yeah yeah, like when she talked about Charlotte and you thought of all the people you knew. Yeah. Didn't that book just kill you when you were a kid? Oh, he's so brave to let us to let us experience death, you know, when we're children. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do now. I'm not sure about you people who do not have your camera on. I'm gonna put you, I don't know if you're there, if you're if you're if you're participating or if you just feel more comfortable listening and not being seen but i think it's it it may help your partner if you do have your camera on um just cuz it's more personable so um what i would like you to do now is you're going to go into um well, we can do it two different ways and I'll let you guys vote. We can go into a free write for about 10 minutes, or you can go into what I call blurt and blab with a partner. And you'll essentially be doing the same thing. Um, I guess if you don't want, if you'd rather have a free write, you can just not join the breakout room, but if you'd rather work with a partner, you could. So I guess we don't have to choose. You, you can just do what you'd like. How does that sound? Okay, so what I want you to do, yeah, B and B. <laughs> so if you don't want to join, I'm going to assume that you're doing a free write. And if you do want to join, I'm going to assume that you want to work with a partner. And this is the thing. So one of you is going to blurt and blab. Again, I want to remind you, you're not trying to entertain. You're not trying to make sense. You're not trying to come out with a perfectly polished story. That's not our job. We're going fishing. You're going fishing. So you're just going to go, oh, man, I remember that girl ahead of me. She always peed her pants after lunch. And you just write that down. You just, oh, I remember the ladies in the lunchroom. They always made goulash on Wednesdays and we had fish sticks because we're Catholic right? You're just going to write it down. You're not trying to make a narrative. You're going fishing. You're going to put everything in the pot, okay? So is there anybody who didn't have anything come up for them during Mrs. Carter? Yeah, I hope I gave you enough. So here's here I'll go over you. The, story, the, the, the description of my teacher is where we started. The description of my classroom the schedule, my other teachers, some of the books we read, the lessons she taught us, um, the way she taught us, um, uh, my sickness when I got into third grade, um, the things that the underlying curriculum, that hidden curriculum, and how I felt, and the sadness that I had, and the, you know, the worry that I had from my parents and my mother you know, and all those things. So all those things that I brought to school with me and the things that she gave back to me. All right. So do you have enough to go fishing? All right. One of you is the storyteller. The other is the exquisite listener. And your job is to really just hold the person. That's all. You don't have to help them or interrupt. All right. You're just going to hold them and tell them how brilliant they are at the end of five minutes, <laughs> because you are. Okay, you guys, I'm gonna set you off. Do your thing. Oops, wait a minute. Oh, shoot, just a second. I gotta do it again. Oh, God. Uh, Back. I do know how to do this. I just did it wrong. Um,
Oh, yeah, I said to Jen, oh, I know how to do bring out room. Uh, okay. It's going to be slow, but I'll get you there. I'm brilliant. Oh. Oh. Yep. Okay, Groovy. Here we go. So I'll give you the five minute, okay, when it's time to switch. Okay. Go for it. Oh, shoot. Hi, Sue. Sue, did you want to be in a group? Are oh, you muted, darling? I came in late. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. But, but I got to hear most of your story, and I oh, it was great. I'm the one that said Yuka Schaefer was my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to be with a partner? Uh, you know, you don't I, have to, you can just do a free write if you'd like. Yeah, maybe this time. And next time we do, I go with partner. Okay, great. Okay, right. enjoy Thank yourself. You. I'll see you in a minute. All right.
What? We're just waiting. I'll sing. By the light <laughs> of the silvery moon. moon da, 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 da. I can't remember the words. <laughs> Actually, Regina, there are a lot of people who are teachers in this group, or I know several. And so they have seen it from both sides. Oh, right. Yeah. I think everybody's back. So um, go ahead and uh, tell me what that experience was like for you. You can unmute or if you want to use your uh, electronic hand, you can. Well, Valerie and I are new BFFs. I know all about her and the nuns. She knows all about me and Jamie Yates, which we will not be sharing, and Kathy Wood and, and Donna Hennis. We know all about those three people and wonder where they are now, knowing that one of them may be in prison. Um, but, but Valerie also shared with me some interesting things about the nuns. And I think I have, uh, I've got a book in mind for the woman behind the nun. So I am real interested in that. But we had the best time and I enjoyed learning about Valerie. And so hmm. it was That's fun. great. That's great. And wow, what a tantalizing introduction. <laughs> So what else was uh, somebody put in the chat that was fun? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, Re Regina, uh, I, I forgot to bring it with me, but I got your book, Jesus and Tea, just so you know. Uh, but uh, Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. And love that plug. Yes. Thank yes, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> write, write, a, write, a, write a review on Amazon. <laughs> I, I, I will get you. Okay. But Reggie, I think what we notice is um, the universality, uh, uh, whether, uh, you know, male, female, black, white, Texas uh, versus Kansas, uh, going through third grade, fourth grade, that same time period, uh, 
didn't didn't matter. Uh, we had the same kind of experiences, and uh, uh, apparently that's a very important time in life too. But uh, I, I think that's the thing that really uh, uh, got me and uh, got both of us that oh, we got a whole lot of stuff in common. Uh, yeah. uh, it's sort of like it may not be the same, but it is the same. I don't know if you know what I mean, but you know. Mm -hmm. Different mm -hmm. friends, but same kind of issues with friends. Different teachers, but the same kind of issues with teachers. Uh, you know that that, which I guess is what you said it was going to be in the first place. So yeah, I didn't lie. Janine, mm -hmm. we 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 passed. We did. We did. Uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. Um, to to as Michael said, the the crossovers and the the commonalities, even though we grew up in in uh, different kinds of situations, but the things with which with which children have to contend. And one thing, because I got off on a different track, but but one thing that uh, that Michael had talked about was was how much he changed when had changed when he went back for his reunion. And I did mention when we were talking that I was the tallest girl in the class and my friend Nancy was the tiniest person in, in the class. And so, but it, I, I was also thinking about how you know, being, being tall and the teasing that came about from that. And so not only being tall, but having really, really curly hair, which mm -hmm. is brushed out now, but you know, which is the same as being sh being short, and at that yeah. time I did have hair, but I got the same thing. No, no. It, it, it took a while for me to learn that tall kids have the same issues that short kids have, that fat kids have, that skinny kids have, but it's all the same issues, and mm -hmm. I think that came out too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited for you to to realize that. <laughs> what else was that like? Was what surprised you about that experience? Yeah, Ellen. You muted, Ellen. I didn't want to stop. I just wanted to keep talking and talking and talking. Mm -hmm. And which was good for me because um, I was talking a little bit about my brother who died in an unhappy kind of state. And this was happy memories. These were good memories. And so it was lovely to to dive down into them again. It was great. Oh, I'm so and, happy. And I had such great listeners that it was, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I loved how quickly I was taken in with, um, I got to spend time with my own brother and my cousins just out of listening to Ellen talk and, and then about being at school with friends. It's just like those connections are so close and so immediate immediate in listening mm -hmm. and it happened too with us just blurting and blabbing away so blurting and blab. yep that pressure I, I hope you're seeing that the the spoken the way into a spoken word story for me i think is spoken word we sit down and try to write and when we do that we concretize language and we also are like Where's the beginning? Where's the problem? You know, J.O. Callahan, my favorite storyteller in the world, said, the story is trying to find itself. You know, it's already in there. You just have to let it find itself. And the way that I do that is to blurt and blab. You know. I took a, a memoir writing class uh, probably about 13 years ago in Kansas. And I'd never done memoir writing and uh, I really, I just retired. So to take a class that was open to anybody, you know, was bizarre, no, no snob, you know, no hard work, no nothing. And I walked in and she came back uh, once a month for about four months there and finally, I just kept my frustration was just overwhelming because I like happy endings and I just couldn't come up with problems. I didn't want to. I wanted something that was uplifting in the world. And she said, well, Letty, it doesn't have to be a serious problem. She said, all your look of a problem and then we'll take the care of the rest. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh. And, and today, just in our Burton Blab, each of us, hinted 
at a problem, but we didn't define it, nor did it define the story. And it, it helped me in the writing years ago. It, it opened the door, you know, because I closed that door tight looking for a, a great novel, I guess, or something. Right. And uh, yeah, a hint <laughs> of a problem. Just a hint. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we again, if it's personal, we're going to take our own take on it anyway. Mm -hmm. And if she was, uh, if Ellen was under that tent with her brother suffocating, well, I was under a tent with Ivan Lee, the bully of the neighborhood, and we were suffocating. And I really hoped he died, you know, <laughs> but he didn't, and that was a problem. <laughs> so it it just goes back and forth, and I like that idea. So if I'm hearing correctly, it was surprising to you to find that there was a universality and a reciprocity. Is that, is, would, do I see heads nodding? Yeah, yeah. Comforting too. It, it's yes. comforting to, to know that your story resonates with other people. Mm -hmm. I think one of the greatest things about personal stories is that we spend the human condition uh, often tells us that we are we are alone and in this we learn we are not alone we are not alone and i i can't think of anything more comforting than that okay but now you got all these memories so what are you going to do with them we shape them right we shape them. We choose them. But again, you're not in any rush to create a great story. You just, uh, whoa, the spotlight thing is like really hard on my ego. Uh, but <laughs> I used to be pretty, but um, <laughs> uh, you still are. <laughs> it's very kind of you. It's like, whoa. Um, but um so we, you know, so we get to go back to third grade. The who, what, where, when, and why's. If we, if we can't understand that, if the listener can't understand that, then you're just tooting your horn. So, and that's, you know, nobody, nobody really needs that. So you have to, I want you to now, of all of these images, that you just shared of all these memories. I really want you to try to choose one that's popping to the top, like the cream and the milk. What is there? Is there some memory? Like I loved listening, Michael, I love listening to you talk about uh, your experience um, as a black boy, you know, that uh that a lot of kids wouldn't know now you know because our lives are different now so what a great story to share and um so what is it like to be you so i'm just gonna i'm i'm assuming that you all have something to write in that you have a piece of paper in front of you And this stuff is where the rubber meets the road because you have got to ground people in the who, what, where, when, and why. The why comes is, is um, uh, inferred, okay? So uh, who, who is in the story? Just write it down. The second part of this question is, who is the main character in the story? My story is about Mrs. Carter, but she's not the main character, is she? Right. It's my story.
Oh, I didn't know that. Janet is reminding us that we can keep notes in the chat and save the chat later to your computer. You want to save time with that. Okay, so we've got the who. What? What what does that question refer to? You can't make a mistake. The plot, what's happening? Yeah. What? So the what is a journey through my third grade class. It's my third grade. So what? Mm -hmm. Janet, you are so good. Thank you. And then we're gonna move on to the where. So where are you? And there might be multiple where's, right? First I'm in my hometown and then I'm in my house and then I'm at school and then I go back to my house. And then we move on to the when. This is, again, this is really important. See, early on in the story, I tell you, it's September 3rd. Tomorrow is the first day of school. I'm going to go to third grade. So, boom, you know exactly when this is. And the question of how, I never really quite understood that question, <laughs> to be honest. So we'll skip it. <laughs> um, anybody got an idea of what the how is? Maybe how something happened. Yeah, or, or maybe maybe the, maybe the conditions. It was a cold day. Mm, I'm thinking maybe the perspective, or how you came to be in that situation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I I think it's the perspective. I think it's how how yeah. things are remembered, mm -hmm. which maybe aren't how they really happened. So, <laughs> I think of how with regard to a, a plot that had a something that needed to be solved, um, you know, what have you, how did you navigate from? Oh. Mm -hmm. Like a mm -hmm. method, like the a step, right. Mm -hmm. steps involved. Right. As I'm thinking, I think, I think uh, unknowingly, I actually would define the how as, <clears throat> um, uh, in a couple of ways, like who, whose eyes are we hearing the story from, you know, whose perspective, but also what, it's more of a mechanical question in terms of, um, I love to put stories in present tense because I think it makes the verbs really pop mm. and the images are much more, much more vivid and you mm. break down, you, you don't have as many words in in um when people go into the past they often will say um i have done da 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 i have then and then i went rather than i'm at 
you see how it's so immediate it's so colorful it's bold it's brisk you know the verbs pop and that makes it pop inside of your mind so the how i think is like is it in first person or third person and is it in present or past tense And then the how also reflects to genre. I guess I did know what the how meant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I had decided I had all these memories around Mrs. Carter that I really wanted to, um, you know, I really wanted to tell about her because I just loved her so much. Um, but there wasn't enough to have just one little thing. Um, so the structure, the genre of the pearls, the string of pearls allowed me to do that. Um, but you have to ask yourself, is this a mystery story? Is this a historical story? What is the order of the story? We know stories have a beginning, a middle and an end, but many stories start at the end and work their way back. So you get to ask yourself, what kind of a form do I want this story? How do I want to tell it? How do I want to unfold it? You know, I, I might start a story with, you might look at me and think, oh, she went to a private boarding school. Well, you would have been right, except it was the St. Lawrence Psychiatric Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I might start that way right? Unnerving somebody or um, he wasn't always dead. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know? So I'm going to put you back in your breakouts and I'm going to ask you to spend time um, trying to now find some shape to the story. You will not be perfect at this. You're going to get in and then you're going to go, oh, man, I should have done that first. Or, oh, that doesn't go with that. It's fine. It's a jigsaw. Okay? That's fine. You're finding the story. The story is looking for itself. And I will give you the note of when to switch. So this time, after you're done being the exquisite listener, the listener is going to do is going to help the storyteller by saying what you noticed and what you wonder. These two questions are so important to help to being a witness to the story. What you notice and what you wonder. Yeah, is it Viveka? Yes. Yes, Viveka. How can I help? You? Yes. Um, just wanted you to go back when when you said when that was referring to the setting when or mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that. Or what? Or what? What? What were you going to say? I cut you off. No, I'm, no, I'm asking. When you were talking about the wins, you were going mm -hmm. through when when you got to win. Um, that's referring to the setting of the story. I refer that that to the to the um, to the time. Right, the time. Okay, and then um, the how you said that would be how will the story be told, including what genre whether it's first or first or third person and the order in and which it's past told. or present tense past or present tense okay yeah thank you so when and we go uh, into our I, breakout sessions we're, we're supposed to go through the who what when where why and how of our story yeah you're just going to try to blurt and blab that mm -hmm. gotcha you know yeah <clears throat> so you're trying to now find a trying to find a dress and stuff the stuff the story in the dress okay or pantyhose <laughs> with holes in them oh with holes in them yeah where the fat bulges out okay here we go
Sue, did you want to join a breakout room this time? Yeah, that would be great if there's room. Yes, yeah, so there's always room for you. Should I just click on join? Yep. Went to your room and no one was there. <laughs> Did you want to do it with somebody? Well, it looks like um, most people are already in something. So. I'm going to move a couple of people. Actually, um, Dean, I can, if you want to get in there, I can, you could be with Mary Ann. Okay. Okay, I'm going to put you in room nine. Actually, oh, Mary Ann's not joined. Okay. Yeah, that's what I, I think it happened. I, um, there she is. Okay, I'll, I'll go there now. Okay, thank you. Bye.
Viveka, what happened to your head? Wait, un unmute, unmute. Oh, here I am. So we, after we rock and we rock the car seat backwards, well, when my head hits the ground, it hits a rock that's embedded in this red clay. Yeah. Well, first of all, we're not supposed to be rocking on that car seat. <laughs> and so we, and we go inside and we, if we tell what's happened, we're all going to be in trouble. So we can't mm -hmm. tell. So the oldest of us, uh, she she reminds us, you, you know, you can't cry because mama will hear it and we'll all get our butts torn up. So I'm trying <laughs> to fight back tears and they rush me in the bathroom. Well, none of us think about the fact that when you see four children <laughs> suddenly rush in the house, that that's going to get everybody's attention. <laughs> we rush in the bathroom and she grabs the alcohol bottle to pour on this spot where my head hits. Well, no, ah. that's not where it hurts. It's the alcohol running in my eyes that hurts. <laughs> and that part, I can't stop, not scream. And so I'm screaming. And then my aunt comes, what are y'all doing? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so. I'm loving it. That's yeah. really wonderful. Yeah, I had completely forgotten about that story. So you, <laughs> yeah, write it down, write it down, write it down. So you mentioned the mattresses. <laughs> Blurt and blab, man. The way to do it. And don't put any pressure on yourself to know what you're doing. You're just remembering. That's yeah. all. You're just remembering. <laughs> you no, know, I think of this experience kind of like, um, like what I do is I. I'll, I'll put a large piece of um, paper bag, you know, I'll unfold the whole bag and have that big piece of paper. And I just tape it, uh, tape it up on the wall. And, and uh, I have some central thing that I want to talk about. And, and I just leave it up for days and days and days, because the more, you know, more space you give it, the more you remember. And, uh, you know, you can't expect yourself to just have it all right there yeah it takes you have to be a friend to a story you know it's like okay i'll listen what do you got to say i'll listen again oh you're back want some tea <laughs> you know okay so we have four minutes left um i'm, I'm so sorry that we only have four minutes because i could spend the whole day with all of you it's been absolutely wonderful um I, I said I told those guys I would leave um uh I would leave um room uh for questions. So you got any? Yeah. Hey Sue. Hi. Well, I am trying to write a story about my family coming from it's now called the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And my mother was born there and my father too, but I don't have all the details. Mm -hmm. And I know I, I'm in the process of trying to find out the details, but how do you, how do you start a story that uh, began so long ago? And uh, That's such a great way to start the story. How do I start a story that began so long ago? Oh, okay. I guess that's a good way. <laughs> I guess I could start it with my grandparents who live now in what was called Ukraine. Or I could start it with me who live in America. But I think I'll start it. See, you, you yeah. Know, just listen to yourself. Yeah, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? That was easier than I thought. <laughs> it's all how so did you easy. just do that? What you just did with her? How did you just do that? Yeah. No, I'm asking you that I, question. I know. I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. <laughs> I know how I do it, but I'm trying to find out how to say how I do it. When I'm listening to storytellers, I'm trying to hear what they're saying underneath the words that they're using. 
So she asked a genuine question. How do I start? A story is a conversation between the teller and the listener. And that's such an intimate question, isn't it? How do I start this? So doesn't that make you want to hear more? Yes. Because you're immediately dropped into the whirlwind of the experience. And so it takes practice to listen on a micro and a meta level, you know, simultaneously. But the secret is really listening with your with your whole mind that includes your heart too. So that's interesting that you say that because I saw a PBS story about uh, a very uh, a, a very famous man that listens to music and he really doesn't know anything about music. But he helps people that write music, that play music, just by listening to what they've created mm -hmm. or what they're singing or playing. Mm -hmm. And just by listening, he knows what needs to be done, knows what knows he knows what needs to be changed, mm -hmm. just a minute thing to make it very powerful. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you are. Thank you. Vivekan, it's also, you know, I, when I first started to tell stories, I was really bad at it. And um, because I thought stories were about words and they're not about words. They're about pictures and image-driven language, you know. What's the best way to deliver the image? And I, I've studied story, you know? I mean, I could have a doctorate in story because I really became a student of story. How, how are they doing what they're doing? How are they using the tools of a storyteller to do that? You know, how are they using voices? How are they using character? What words are they choosing? And some of it is just nuts and bolts. Is it in present or past tense? What's the genre? Why did they choose that genre? I tear stories apart like a musician does because I want to know how to do it really well. You know, I love storytelling. <laughs> And because I feel like God made me to be a storyteller and I want to do a good job with it. You know, I want to make God proud of me. And um, so the greatest skill a storyteller can have is to be a good listener. It's not about charisma, dazzle. It's really... How well am I listening? But the secret, of course, is how well am I listening to my own heart? How well am I listening? How deeply am I listening? You know, so when she says that question, how do I start? It's a beautiful question, you know. Because she's, she's trying to find out who do I listen to? Who do I give voice to? So, I don't know, I've been to a lot of workshops where they're kind of mechanical. And um, there is a place for that because you have to know story structure. And to know story structure, 
really means that you have to know the traditional literature. You have got to know it. You have got to know the thousand variants of Cinderella. You just do. That's that's your work. You've got to know the work. Um, and it's fun, you know, <laughs> it's fun. What better way to spend an afternoon? But um, there's so much more story underneath the story. And that's something that happens. I don't know. I, I think it takes some amount of bravery, you know, to tell the story that people might not really want to hear, but that's true and that's real and that everybody is experiencing because you are not alone. It's the storyteller's job to tell the hard stories because that's our job. Yeah, we give voice to the culture. Anyway. I hope I didn't get too weird. <laughs> it's always a possibility with me. Thank you so much, Reggie. This was great. Uh, I'm so happy. Do you have any other questions? Oh, gosh, I've kept you after time. I'm so sorry. Wow. I had one, but I don't remember what it is. Now, I didn't write it down, unfortunately. Well, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Okay. And you can just write me, and I would love to hear your stories. You can write me anything you want. Okay. So it's Reggie okay. at ReggieCarpenter.com. And I hope to see you in person in Texas sometime. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, let's. Please, all a round of applause for our Reggie Carpenter and for ourselves. She would want us to give us yes. a round of applause for ourselves. <laughs> and um, so thank you very much, Reggie. Sure. Uh, we all thank you. I know we do. I'm, I'm just so pleased to have been able to be here tonight. Janet, please put in the chat about our festival coming up in March. I know perhaps yeah, all of you ha have received the information so that you can sign up and be there i look forward to seeing you all there i don't know how fast i need to talk to close up out tonight but i'm just so grateful thank you tsa again for yes, supporting thank us you, thank, you. Uh, thank you reggie carpenter for bringing this workshop to us and telling your stories and lending us your heart for this time mm -hmm. tonight yeah. um, thank you all it's lovely to see you and i thank you Yep, with that. So Michael Brundy is seeking volunteers. Oh, oh that's right. Oh. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's our managing director from the Texas Festival, uh, making sure that uh, she reminds you guys, uh, reminds me that uh, uh, for the Denton Storytelling Festival, I'm, I'm on the board and I'm in charge of uh, helping getting volunteers. Uh, uh, what I've learned is that it really doesn't work without us volunteering. So uh, you guys, uh, uh, don't make me look bad. Volunteer. Help out. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. Virtual, is there going to be a virtual at part of the festival? No, I'm there's not. Bye-bye. Okay. Good night, Bye -bye. Reggie. Thank, thank you, you, Reggie. Good night. Yes, thank you all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.